So I love primes, but I absolutely hate having to constantly switch out lenses. So what if I told you that you could still use your prime lens and get wider photos and get a bit of extra reach without ever actually having to take the lens off. So that's exactly what I'm gonna show you how to do today. I'm gonna show you two tricks I use all the time on how to get multiple focal lengths using the same prime lens and how you can turn basic images like this into unique perspectives like this. So if you've been in the world of photography for a while now, you've probably heard of medium format and how it has a special look. And if you haven't heard of it before, it's pretty much just the next sensor size up from full frame. Now I'm gonna put this away for now and I'll come back to this and explain the minute differences between sensor sizes a little bit later in this video. So the first technique I'm gonna show you guys is how to create wider photos. What we're gonna uncover today is the power of photo stitching. This is the process of merging multiple photos together to create a wider scene. And this is just really just one way of using this technique. You could use this technique for a lot of different things. This is essentially limitless because you can just keep adding more and more photos to a scene until you create a 360 degree field of view. However, that's taking this technique to the extreme and just sounds a little bit tacky. This is also a similar process as the Brandizer method, so you can use this technique to recreate some extreme bokeh. And I know this may seem really complicated and all, but I promise you this is super simple as long as you're using modern software like Lightroom. Now I apologize for my pronunciation of this, but this is a photo I took of Mount Agung in Indonesia. This was stitched together using 40 images, which is really crazy because I was using my 90 millimeter. Just for comparison, this is my 11 millimeter. If I zoom in, you can see that my compression looks the exact same. But this is also where it gets really, really interesting. Why does it do that? For me to fully explain this, I'm gonna need to really break this down a little bit more. This is because the lens focal length is calculated by how far the light converges in relation to the distance to the sensor. However, this number isn't that helpful to determine the image circle size that the lens can actually produce. These are why lenses are designed for different sensor sizes and why full frame lenses are huge in comparison to APS-C and Micro Four Third lenses. Now, you can only change this image circle, but in two ways, by moving the lens further away, which effectively changes the focal length and the aperture and focus plane and some other stuff. So that doesn't really work. Or you can just make the lenses larger. This is important because the larger your image circle is, the more field of view you're actually able to capture. This is why a 50 millimeter lens becomes 75 millimeters on an APS-C camera and 100 millimeters on micro four thirds. However, if you're using a sensor that's larger than full frame, like the GFX cameras or Hasselblads, it's actually much bigger than full frame which it actually means it gets a negative crop. For the GFX cameras or the Hasselblads, that's about a 0.79 crop. And for the RZ, it's about a 0.5 crop. This is what the NX image circle look like. This is what the full frame image circle look like. And now this is what the RZ image circle looks like. And as you can see, it looks huge, which makes that 50 millimeter on full frame about a 25 millimeter on this camera. Now, effectively with photo stitching, we're just creating a larger sensor, but only exposing individual parts of the image at a time. That's why this looks like a much more larger format image, even though we're shooting it on a smaller sensor. So with every additional photo that we take, we end up adding about one to two thirds of our original sensor size to our new effective sensor size. And this technique adds so much more versatility to your lenses now, and allows you to travel lighter so you don't need to carry like five different lenses. You don't even need to go this extreme either. You can stitch as little as two photos together, but I usually stitch somewhere between three to 15 photos. One caveat I will say with this technique is if you're stitching more than 30 photos, you may need a pretty beefy computer to keep up. Every additional photo that you take adds to the final resolution of the image, so it really adds up really fast. But don't worry, as long as your computer is able to actually do the photo stitching part, you can just downsample the image later and make a more manageable file size. I'm not even the most insane person. I've seen people make gigapixel photos, which is absolutely massive photos and they're using a 200 mil lens or a 400 mil lens and then making this exact same field of view, which is super crazy and way above and beyond. So just how do we pull this off? Well, I'm gonna break it down here first so we don't make any mistakes and then we'll go aside and I'll show you how fast this is. Now, it doesn't really matter what order we shoot these photos in, but I find for best results comes from starting from where your subject is or where you're gonna have the most motion. This could be a waterfall, a person, or whatever your subject is. This is gonna be our first photo. From here, we're gonna move our framing over slightly and try to keep about one third of our frame from the last photo. 
Then we just snap the next photo and keep repeating this until we complete the row. Once we're done this row, we can just move up a column. And again, we just want to keep one third of the previous row in the frame and start snapping the next row. Then you can just keep snapping until you have everything you want covered. And that's essentially the whole process. Now there's a couple more things which I'm going to touch base when we actually get out there. Wow, it is really windy. All right, so I'm out here at the Blue Water Bridge. I'm shooting on a 17 mil lens right now, so you can get an idea of how wide this is. I am shooting with my A7S III and my favorite lens, the 55 Zeiss. So for best results, we're gonna wanna shoot in manual mode and set our white balance. The reason why we wanna do this is so when we bring our images into Lightroom, the exposure and the white balance stays consistent. So you don't want our fifth frame to be darker and way more warmer than our first frame. So right now, it's sun's out, gun's out, so I'm just gonna set my camera into daylight mode. A pro tip here before we actually start shooting is that if you want our final image to be landscape or portrait, you want to shoot the opposite orientation. So if we're shooting landscape, we actually want to shoot in vertical mode. And if we're shooting portrait, we want to actually be shooting in horizontal mode. The reason why we do this is so that we get extra height. So you actually have to shoot less columns or less rows, which makes it a lot easier for the software to handle. Pretty much it, we're ready to go. So. I'm gonna zoom in here a bit. It's gonna track me. And uh, I'll get a few angles of this, but I'll show you how easy it is. So after we take our first frame, we're also gonna to wanna to put our camera into manual focus. You can do this before or after, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that we wanna do is to make sure our focus is consistent across all our photos. You can either change the setting in your camera or a little switch on your lens if you have it. So once we start snapping, we're gonna to wanna to lock our feet and not change our height too much. So I'm locking my feet down. I'm shooting in vertical mode and I'm ready to go. <laughs> Just remember to keep about one third of the frame in your shot. And that's pretty much it. 20 seconds of taking photos and we're ready to call it a wrap. So pretty much just gonna go home from here, upload all the images and let Lightroom do the rest. So once we import these images into Lightroom, there's really no heavy lifting on our part. We just need to select all the photos that we want to merge and just left click and press photo merge panorama. Now Lightroom's gonna ask which projection you wanna use. Now when it comes to the projection part, this is really gonna depend on your lens, but I usually just select whichever one looks the nicest to me and then just work off that one. You're also gonna see some other check boxes here to check whichever ones you want and whichever ones you don't need. Auto crop is just gonna crop out the biggest image you can and then auto generate may fill in any gaps that you might have not taken photos of which in this case, we'll probably fill in a bit of the water, the sky and the rocks here. And since you can't go back, this is an awesome tool because you can never regenerate the sky or whatever series of lighting and so on. Now I'm just gonna let my computer cook for a few seconds. And that's pretty much it. A wide angle image from a 55 millimeter lens. Now I didn't take a wide angle image to get an exact reference of how wide this image is, but if I had to guess, it's probably about a 20 to 24 millimeter here. Now there is a few caveats of this. If you have a lot of things moving in your photo, you might get a lot of ghosting or stuff like that. And it's not always gonna work, but doing this handheld, this is pretty good. Now, if your computer is having a really hard time processing this resolution, I would say down simple get your image to about 10,000 megapixels, the long edge. That's gonna give you a lot of extra cropping room and a lot easier for computer handle. So now that I've covered how to make primes wider, how about making them more telephoto? Well, going this way, it's gonna be a little bit more limited and it's gonna depend on what gear you're using. In this case, it's your camera. But don't worry, it doesn't really matter too, too much because there's always still gonna be something you can always do. Just as I explained before about crop factors, depending on your camera, you may already simply have a crop shooting mode. This is automatically gonna add a 1.5 times crop to your images while you're shooting, making that 50 millimeter into a 75 millimeter at the expense of some resolution. Now, usually this is a feature that's only available on full frame cameras, and it's used to use APS-C size lenses on full frame, which is one of the only few major benefits of why I like using a full frame camera. APS-C mode on my A7R5 is still about a 26 megapixel image, which still leaves me a ton of extra room to push this even further in post. But on a more traditional 24 megapixel camera, results are still going to be over 10 megapixels, which for most cases is going to be plenty as you can still get to 20 to 30 inch prints with that. 
and on social media, we only need about two megapixels, so you could still do a bit of cropping afterwards. Now, this method is essentially just the same as cropping your image in post, but you're just standing further back to get a more narrow perspective. It's a little different because you get the live perspective of what the more telephoto lens would have been. And if you're using the power of AI tools, you can even push this even further, really pushing your lenses to the next level. You can recreate extra bokeh and get the same amount of compression as those telephoto lenses. So if you're interested in seeing a breakdown of this, you should check out my video of how I use a 16 millimeter and AI tools to mimic portraiture and macro images from my telephoto lenses. And while you're at it, don't forget to leave a like or subscribe to the channel if you want to keep in touch for future videos. And until next time, ciao.